first a little taxonomy. Uh, interplanetary CubeSats, um, we can imagine three basic varieties. One is they just go off a launch vehicle that's already going to Earth escape. Uh, maybe they go along with a Mars mission or a Jupiter mission or whatever. And they go their own way. They cruise out there. They don't have their own propulsion or whatever. Or they could go with one of those missions using it as a, as a mothership and go different places from there. But the one we chose to focus on was self-propelled interplanetary fuel sets. You not only got the car and the keys to the car, but you got an engine in the car and you get up and go somewhere and go a lot of places. And so there are a lot of kinds of interplanetary fuel sets we haven't focused on. We've focused on this last one here. And we've come up with seven different example missions, which we're studying in a little bit of detail, and I'll get into later. But just the, the message here is that they have applications to a broad variety of the science community that's interested in going out into the solar system. So we've got one for small body science, we've got a couple for astrophysics, we've got space and heliophysics, but clearly for technology demonstration uh, related to going faster and getting out quicker the solar system escape mission is, is along those lines. So the uh, what we've been spending much of our time on over the last two months is examining the progression of the six fundamental technologies. In fact, I'll, I'll go back to that chart. If you if you see the blue labels around sort of in, in counterclockwise fashion there that are numbered, those six technologies, when put together in the right way, enable one to have a very small, inexpensive satellite with a lot of capability that can go interplanetary, that can go beyond low Earth orbit or beyond medium Earth orbit, and do some pretty exciting things we thought at first just in the inner solar system, but as we go into this, we see a number of other solar system applications as well. So our study is about those six technologies and how they need uh, how they need to be developed so they converge on a set of capabilities that's useful for doing these other things at much lower cost. So, uh, for example, uh, CubeSat bus power is now possible to get about five, five or six watts out of a kilogram of CubeSat equipment. And we see that as going up into the 25 watts per kilogram arena uh, in, over the next uh, 50 to 20 years. And that begins to enable other kinds of things as you can do that. Either more power in this vicinity of the solar system or allowing it to move out of the asteroid belt with uh, photovoltaics. Uh, bus longevity was a big problem that people pointed out. They said, oh, these little cubes at the universities launch. Uh, a lot of them don't work. Well, it's true. Maybe 20% of them don't work. That means about 80% of them do. The longest lived CubeSat today that's in orbit has been operating for nine years. Uh, and so, but that's low Earth orbit. It's inside the magnetic cocoon of the Earth's magnetosphere. And so, uh, one way to go is with red heart components, but most of those are power hungry. They're very expensive. And so we have been looking, particularly the folks at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Paula Fingri at JPL, have been looking at how to <coughs> work with the, the CMOS equipment that's being built and getting better <coughs> by Moore's Law and operating that maybe a little bit differently to get us out of the latch up regime, but still be able to do the computation, the control, and that sort of thing. And all that looks like it'll work out. Uh, so just to let you know what I'm thinking about in terms of configuration, this is. Uh, the solar panels are deployed at the top, but if you look at that uh, uh, box down below, the sort of serial box ratio of dimensions, that's 10 by 20 by 30 centimeters. The first so-called, that's called a 60 cube set, six 10, 10 centimeter cubes sort of put together in that configuration. The first 60 cube set is going to be launched later this year. Ames, Wallace, and the private company are all developing canisters that are being qualified for variety of launch vehicles. And that was the threshold that we had to get to to have true interplanetary capability with useful science results. So we're doing some configuration trades. But the biggest, the tallest tentpole for technology for interplanetary CubeSats was telecom. Uh, people were taught were proud of 100 kilobits per second in lower Earth orbit when you're flying over the ground station. How can you possibly do anything useful from, say, two astronomical units? And, and it was my question to one of our people who's well grounded in physics. I said, Randy, do you think it's possible to get a useful communications device, an optical communications device, crammed into one U and run it for any reasonable amount of power? And this is the answer that came back. Um, if you look at the, uh, the two yellow boxes there, that's uh, the data rate in kilobits per 
seconds from 2 AU to uh, uh, JPL's the Caltex Palomar Mountain Telescope, 5 meter telescope, and with an uplink coming from JPL Table Mountain Observatory, the 1 meter uplink. We can sustain uh, over a kilobit per second from 2 AU. Uh, and we, have, we think we have a path to go uh, just beyond that. And so the device you see at the lower left there, that's all in one U. It's about this big. Uh, it's conceptual at this point. Uh, we're trading off the other two optical schemes that you see there as other ways of accomplishing this. But all this is, you know, if we're lucky, it's at TRL maybe three today. Uh, so it's got a ways to go. Uh, it, it depends on the pointing of the host cell. We don't do all the pointing. There's a fine steering mirror inside that. But um, you had, five years ago, CubeSats were basically just passively stabilized. Some of them would have magnets and they'd follow your magnetic field as they go to orbit. Now you can buy today, the National Reconnaissance Office has bought 20 of them, three new CubeSats that are stabilized to half a degree in three axes, three signals. And we expect that to improve, but that's good enough to host the scheme that you saw that fits in one U a few years from now. Uh, we can't do it today. This is some of the electronics, including on the bottom, is the uh, the very first Red Heart by design, Xilinx Vertex 5 FPGA, was flown aboard University of Michigan CubeSat, the MQ CubeSat, and Paula Fingry, our co I, uh, was PI on that experiment. That flew uh, in for the NPP launch, it's being reef, it's just been funded for reflight because it got stuck to the Montana State University satellite that's broadcasting at a frequency very close to the receiver on the University of Michigan satellite. So we haven't been able to get commands and so we're going to do it again. Uh, but you can see the, the, the day and night uh, uh, data rates, you can see the prediction that uh, Hamid had there for around 2015, uh, the rates that you saw on that chart. And this is kind of notional at this point. Uh, we're going to fill in some numbers and have rationale for them uh, as we go on. But we expect those rates to increase by a factor of four or five over the next one years. So the solar sail, of course, that's our key to getting around. And so uh, we, we had planetary society and solar exploration to fly up the solar sail.
for the performance of the sale that we never thought was likely uh, early on here. So there's a few more charts in here than I will actually, than I actually have time to present to. But one of the examples over here is the traditional way of getting to high solar latitudes to look down on the poles of the sun is you go in close to the sun and then you crank the orbit around and then, and then you go back out and you look down or you go out to Jupiter like Ulysses did and go over the pole. It turns out there's a family of so-called vertical orbits that we believe exist. We haven't explored this entirely, but we've just begun, Martin and his folks at USC have just begun to look at this where we think that you can use that in the first vicinity that you depart from 1AU and go to a high solar latitude without having to do either of those other two arrangements that I described. So it gets you out of the thermal constraints and out of the radiation uh, from Jupiter. So I think I'll skip that one, but just go here. This is an illustration of the roadmap of the, of the interplanetary superhighway and each of these little tubes represents a way of getting from one kind of orbit to another much more efficiently than those of us who went to school 40 years ago learned that the home and transfer was the most efficient way to get anywhere. If not, the universe is a lot more complicated and we, and we can take advantage of that complication. So we're also looking very heavily into uh, onboard data processing because while I was thrilled to learn that we could get a kilobit per second back from 1AU, I'd like to get the information content of 100 kilobits per second back from 1AU or 2AU. So how do you do that? Well, you do a bunch of processing on board in some cases. But for example, hyperspectral imagers, which we look at, imaging spectroscopy, is a huge data generator, useful in mineral mapping of asteroids and other applications. But if we can generate the map on board and send that back, that takes a whole lot fewer bits than sending back all the bits of the instrument acquired in 256 colors over 600 pixels across the field of view and so on. Now, we aren't, the science people don't want us to go all the way that way, so there's some happy medium there, and we're examining where that is, but it's the processing capability of things like that and the, the successor units that will come along with people are talking about the Vertex 7 today and so on. It's going to give us a lot more information content for the bits that we're able to send back. So I'm going to cover just a couple of these example missions briefly. Um, it turns out, this is a totally crazy idea and may turn out not to work out, but we believe we can do a Phobos sample return with two interplanetary CubeSats. They fly together, they leave Earth, they go to Mars, they break into Mars orbit, and then they, they, one of them goes down to the surface of Phobos and then using some of the stuff like what we heard, I, I, I need to talk with one of our other guys here, right, right, kick something back up at how many centimeters a second to escape? Uh, Twelve. Okay. Twelve centimeters a second from the surface of Phobos puts you in Mars orbit where the other CubeSat goes and picks you up and takes you back into Earth orbit to, to wait to be picked up and brought down. So, totally wild, but it might work. Uh, we can get to the Earth-Moon L points pretty easily, so we're looking, uh, we, we also learned from our radio astronomy friends who, who joined us that you can use the solar sail as a good antenna to look at the 21 centimeter hydrogen line as it's been redshifted since the pre-stellar period of the universe after the Big Bang, but before the stars formed. It turns out to be roughly in the FM band. You can't hear anything in the FM band with a radio telescope from the Earth. But in the radio quiet region that is the moon's shadow from the Earth, we can go map that region and determine if that region is quiet enough in order to make those measurements. And if it is, then propose a bigger mission, not a huge that would that go there with a the big receiver. And um, I told you about the solar polar imager, and we're, there we're talking about not just a single CubeSat, but a, a constellation of them having a variety of different uh, scientific measurements and correlating those in space and time. Uh, mineral mapping of asteroids, uh, there we can, we figured out how to put an imaging spectrometer like the one that we flew on Moon Mineralogy Mapper, a little bit less capable, but still able to do the, the mineral mapping of what we expect to find in asteroids to fit in 2U. The one on Chandrayaan-1, Moon Mineralogy Mapper, was about 8.5 kilograms. 
we can do an instrument with almost that capability uh, for a little under two kilograms. Uh, it actually is the same sector that this optical uh, as, as you see here from uh, this is another of our co-eyes uh, in the of the world. And it's based on an instrument that we just delivered to NASA for airborne applications. That one has, you know, rats and equipment around and stuff like that. So we figured out how to, how to put that stuff uh, uh, what we need to do that. So our uh, preliminary conclusions from so far in the into this NIAC work uh, is there's a whole variety of issues that you can do that will be enabled by these six technologies converting on to some solution points uh, for asteroid mapping, for heliophysics, for maybe even returning samples from Mars or rapid escape from the solar system. Uh, they are much more challenging than the lower Earth orbit CubeSats, but we believe that we, we've got the university on our team, we have a fine grade society, we have a small business, we believe that the technologies and the skill sets that are needed to make these happen uh, can be uh, matured in a way that at least the well-equipped universities around the world will be able to mount these missions. And we're talking about for a tenth the cost of a discovery mission, maybe even less than that. So uh, we're thinking, you know, up to $30 million. Uh, and some of them are, we believe, are, are completely credible and scientifically useful for uh, on the order of a little five million or uh, Then uh, there are all kinds of technology leaps and improvements, and we're focusing on some of those in the farther term. Uh, and uh, we're going to put together what we call these roadmaps that we think will, will help guide people's thinking in that realm and cause some controversy and some useful discussion. Uh, but the, the bottom line for our team in terms of advice to the youth folks at, at NASA headquarters is two things would really help a lot to, to realize the potential of, if, if you recall our investigation, it was to open solar system exploration to a broad community at lower cost. Thing one is for NASA to make available uh, CubeSat slots in, with six U containers on the launches that are going to the nearest station. Okay, so like maybe it would be the earliest, we're probably too late for that. But any, anything going to a C3 of about zero, either to the moon or to Earth escape. Um, and the second thing is to fund developments that fund opportunities that allow people to utilize that. And then we can see on if, if, if we do that and we work out the geostationary arrangement, which I think is pretty straightforward, we could see uh, five to ten interplanetary missions launching a year within ten years from now, instead of the rate of five to ten per decade that we have today. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you.